She lived at the Karada neighborhood, for those listeners who know it. It's a Uh, considered a very safe uh, neighborhood uh, in uh, Baghdad. It's full of Iraqi police. There are a lot of Westerners uh, there, Basli markets. It's considered a very safe area. Um, she went to a coffee shop and never came back. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 25th, 2024. One year ago, Elizabeth Tsirkoff A graduate student at Princeton University was abducted in Baghdad, where she was doing field work by the terrorist organization Khatib Hezbollah. Since that day, her sister, Emma Tsirkov, has been campaigning for and seeking her release. On Thursday, Emma Tsirkov held a rally outside the Iraqi embassy, demanding action to free her sister. Afterwards, she joined me in the virtual jungle studio to discuss her sister's very upsetting case. Who is Khatib Hezbollah and why are they holding hostage an Israeli graduate student? Who is Elizabeth Tsirkoff and how did she come to be in Baghdad in the first place? Which government is responsible for securing her release? Is it the Israelis, the Russians? Or is it the United States' job? And why does the United States keep providing military aid to a government that is in bed with Khatib Hezbollah, a designated foreign terrorist organization? It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 25th, one year since the kidnapping of Elizabeth Tsirkoff. So let's start at the beginning Who is Elizabeth Tsirkoff and who is Emma Tsirkoff? I feel like you asked two separate questions, but it's actually one. Yes. Because for, for purposes of this conversation, it's an important relationship. Well, also because not just for the purposes of this uh, conversation, but I'm Emma and my sister Elizabeth, uh, we're a year apart. So we've spent our entire childhood uh, constantly right next to each other. We were always kind of the one permanent thing in each other's uh, life. So it's almost hard to think of who I am without thinking about her. But I guess the, I don't know, boring uh, uh, answer is that Elizabeth is uh, my sister, but also A scholar, she is uh, doing a PhD in political science at Princeton uh, University, uh, studying sectarianism in the Middle East. Um, she is uh, also um, a freelance uh, journalist and human rights activist. Uh, some of your listeners might know her work as someone who's been uh, very seriously following the conflict um, in Syria and in Iraq. And generally writing um, about the Middle East. Yeah, uh, she is uh, really very tech-savvy and very good uh, about reaching audiences online um, in a way that very few can, which uh, is basically the way it, it's... kind of her superpowers. That's how she gathered such a big following on uh, Twitter. And uh, she is a uniquely compassionate person. So she is able to have conversations and try to relate and understand uh, people uh, in ways that very few scholars of the Middle East can and do. Um, and generally, um, she is a scholar who believes in kind of the public good of scholarship, that it shouldn't be a scholarship, good scholarship should be not just for consumption through the medium of like high jargon uh, journalistic articles, but also through some contribution to the world around us. And the boring answer about me is that uh, I'm Emma uh, and I'm Elizabeth, the younger sister, um, although we often joke that she abdicated being the oldest, um, and I took on the uh, role of always being the kind of pragmatic one who, like, ends up doing all the things. 
Um, You're responsible, and 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 she runs off to Syria and Iraq. She like yeah. has a lot of the youngest child in her, I think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm always kind of the one who, if someone in our family needs to do something, it's probably going to be me who will end up doing it. And yeah, that has uh, always been the case. And yeah, I am risk avoidant, and she isn't. And so why are we sitting here on March 21st, 2024, talking about Elizabeth and you being her sister? Because I love flying to the sea on red eyes. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, sorry, my humor is a um, way I deflect the seriousness and gravity of all this horror show uh, that has been my life for the last year. And we are here talking today because uh, exactly a year ago, um, Khatib Hezbollah, which is a Shia uh, Iran-backed militia in Iraq, kidnapped my sister and a piece of my heart and has been holding her hostage ever since. Okay, so for those listeners who for whom the name Khatib Hezbollah does not ring all the bells at once, uh, this is the group that the United States has uh, had repeated military interactions with over the last several months. Uh, it is an Iran-backed Shia group in Iraq. Tell us about them. You've become, against your will, something of an expert on Khatib Hezbollah. What do we know about them? And uh, then we can get into uh, how they came to be holding your sister. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that I became an expert against my will. Uh, because exactly a year ago today, I Googled Khatib Hezbollah. I literally had no idea who these people are. I lived a world glorious with oblivion about who they are. But yeah, now I know the names of many of the leaders. They are pseudonyms. I can identify them in photos. And I follow their uh, social media accounts. So Khatib Hezbollah, um, is, uh, like you said, it's a Shia a militia. It's a and just to be clear for listeners, it is not Hezbollah, the Lebanese Iran-backed Shia uh, southern Lebanese organization. It's its own thing in Iraq. Yeah, it's not a franchise. It's its own separate, I guess, terror group. Hezbollah in Iraq, they do have a relationship with Lebanese Hezbollah because they're all part of this uh, group of the axis of resistance, which uh, are um, kind of militias, uh, Shia militias, which are aligned uh, with um, the Iranian uh, government, uh, but they are separate, completely separate uh, entities. Khatib Hezbollah was designated um, a foreign uh, terror organization by the State Department in 2009 during the initial uh, f uh, fight in Iraq against uh, the coalition forces. They uh, participated actively in that. Then in uh, 2014, um, when the Popular Mobilization Forces were created, which is kind of an umbrella organization for those uh, militias. And this umbrella organization was created to coordinate um, the different Shia, uh, mostly Shia, not just Shia militias, that um, fight uh, against ISIS. And they were a big part of the fighting power against ISIS that led to ISIS uh, uh, defeat. And in 2016, uh, after uh, the ISIS war pre uh, pretty much ended, the Popular Mobilization Forces was this large group of militias that are armed and have spent years at that point in combat. But And it wasn't clear how exactly, what, what directions they're going to go in. Um, so they were actually integrated into the Iraqi government. And uh, basically became part of the uh, Iraqi armed forces. Um, all members of the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces, are Iraqi government employees. They even have uh, government pensions starting this year. So your sister, just to be 
blunt about it is being held by a designated foreign terrorist organization that is also a component of the Iraqi government uh, with which uh, the United States has both designated this group and as a foreign terrorist organization and conducts regular military actions against it and it against us and also funds the Iraqi government which uh, supports and uh, uh, gives pensions to its members. Yeah, as the U.S. is both funding and fighting uh, KH. So that's, uh, I guess, part. When I first got into understanding who they are, I thought I must be like misunderstanding it. I'm lacking some political science degrees that will help me unlock how does it make any sense that somehow on one hand, um, the Iraqi government is an ally of the United States. Um, the bilateral relationship is of great strategic importance to both the U.S. and the Iraqi government. And the U.S. is sending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of assistance to Iraq annually. Just last year, it was $630 million. Some of it is humanitarian aid, which makes perfect sense. Um, but also close to 40% of it is actually military assistance. And in the explanation for the budgetary allocation for that, it says that uh, this uh, military assistance is uh, meant to strengthen the Iraqi armed forces and help preserve uh, Iraqi sovereignty. However, at the same time, the Iraqi government has as part of it this Popular Mobilization Forces organization. Um, and in it, not everyone within the PMF is a member of KH. There are different uh, militia. Different components of yeah. different militia components. But KH is a, a long considered um, the most prominent uh, of them. And the 45th, uh, 46th, and 47th Brigade of uh, the PMF are staffed fully by uh, KH. And essentially, a lot of the control over the PMF um, is runs through Abu Fadak, who is a KH leader. So I want to shift to your sister's specific situation. And I should say for listeners, I, I have actually never met Elizabeth, but we're old Twitter buddies and uh, – and I used to text uh, occasionally on WhatsApp. And I have sort of, despite never having met her, always considered her sort of a an internet friend. A lot of people are listening to this and saying, OK, Emma Tsirkov has a Russian name. She has an Israeli accent. Um, so her sister must be Israeli. And uh, Israelis don't go to Baghdad and they don't go to Syria. So walk us through how Elizabeth came to be in Baghdad in the first place a year ago today and, and her history in Syria and Iraq. Yeah. So you're on to me with the accent. <laughs> Darn it. I try so hard to cover it. Anyway. Um, it's the M's. <laughs> yeah. I think it's also easier to understand when you meet me in person because I use my hands too much. So you're like, oh, this one. She's an Israeli. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, so um, first of all, I would say is that uh, generally Baghdad is not uh, kind of a <laughs> frequent uh, destination for vacations for Israelis, but I wouldn't say that there are never any Israelis in uh, Iraq. Uh, there are journalists uh, who cover uh, different parts of the Middle East, and the good ones actually travel to the places that they cover. But you can't fly to Iraq on, a, on an Israeli passport except to the – the, the northern Kurdish regions, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, my uh, sister, as am I, uh, were also Russian citizens. So she um, used her Russian passport to enter, which is legal for in Iraq. So uh, uh, Russian citizens are very much allowed to enter uh, Iraq. Um, the reason she was uh, in Iraq is uh, to do field work for her dissertation. My sister is someone who uh, really believes in that good research and good journalism uh, has to be done at the level of the phenomena of interest. And now I'm telling you myself sounding like an academic. But 
basically, she believes that uh, no one should be talking over someone's head to explain their life. And that if you want to understand the lives and political processes of Iraq, you need to go talk to some Iraqis to understand that. And that simply kind of reading online or um, kind of looking from above doesn't get you the, the full view of what is actually happening. Uh, my sister is someone who is very committed to uh, trying to alleviate um, the kind of push factors of sectarian uh, violence. So she is really interested in how that can be done on an interpersonal level. Um, that's as an academic. And like I said, as a journalist, she uh, frequently uh, lamented how kind of flattened coverage of the Middle East can be when it's done without actually traveling to the place of conflict. And it's true that when someone covers areas of conflict, they often travel to areas of conflict. That doesn't tell some risk. But she she wasn't there on some joyride seeking excitement or something like she that. She was living there. Yeah. Um, she was uh, there doing field work. She was interviewing people for her uh, dissertation, transcribing them, writing it into memos, uh, writing it into chapters of her dissertations. This isn't uh, – she wasn't there um, just kind of trying to do something uh, stupid or brave. Um, she just uh, strongly believes that that's how research on Iraq should be done. And it's uh, I notice myself um, switching almost to past tense. And I keep reminding myself that I should not do that. I, yeah. So before she was in Iraq, she had spent a lot of time in Syria. Like uh, she was there for quite a while, right? So um, she made some visits uh, to Syria. She spent a lot of time on the Turkish border next to Syria. But in Syria uh, herself, she visited a few times, but briefly. I see. OK. So one thing Elizabeth is not is a U.S. citizen. But she is a student at an American university, which is to say she is a graduate student at Princeton and so I guess in the broadest sense, I want to I get into the circumstances that we know of her kidnapping. Um, but what, it, what is the U.S. interest here? This is uh, an Israeli scholar at an American university traveling on a Russian passport. And you're here in America, in Washington, uh, advocating for American – intervention or uh, work to get her out. And why isn't the right answer to that, hey, you know, she's got an Israeli government to advocate her for her. She's got a Russian government to advocate for her. Why is this our problem? The flights to Moscow are way more expensive and the <laughs> weather there is so much worse. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, like I said, uh, being flippant is the way I deal with uh, the horror of it. Um, so um, let me kind of unpack that yep. uh, multifaceted uh, question. So let me start by the countries of citizenship. So the the Russian government, uh, as your listeners fully know, is a little preoccupied with other global events. And I have been in touch with the Russian government, but that has not yielded my sister's freedom as of yet. So that's uh, currently not a solution uh, to her uh, continued uh, kidnapping. And in terms of the Israeli government, the Israeli government, as your listeners know, is also kind of preoccupied with... Some other hostages. Is, yes, uh, and other concerns as well. Um, but uh, more importantly, Israel and Iraq do not have uh, formal ties. In fact, uh, Iraq was one of the countries that declared war with Israel at the time the state of Israel was founded in 1948. And one of the, I think, two only countries that never reached a ceasefire agreement. 
with Israel. So generally uh, speaking, there is uh, no relationship between the two countries, and there is an anti-normalization law in Iraq that was passed, I want to say, in 2022. But I'm, I would have to fact check myself on that. Um, is that basically uh, imposes uh, long prison sentences for any Iraqis who would come into any contact with Israelis or promote normalization with Israel in any shape or form. So there is just very strong stigma against having any type of interaction with uh, Israel and Israelis. Um, so at this point, any type of uh, effort by the Israeli government to get my sister out would actually be more harmful to her situation than it would help because no one in Iraq is currently interested in doing any favors to the, uh, to the Israeli government. Now, when it comes to the uh, U.S. interest here, so I have, I would say, a threefold uh, answer to that question. So the first one is that uh, my sister is a journalist and an activist and publishes a lot with uh, U.S.-based uh, media organizations and is generally someone... So the U.S. Uh, has a strong commitment to journalistic uh, freedom and freedom of speech, and that global value includes exactly that, the fight for the freedom of journalists around the world. In addition to that, as you mentioned, uh, she's a doctoral student uh, at Princeton. She was in Baghdad and was kidnapped while doing fieldwork uh, for her uh, dissertation. Princeton is a, a partially federally funded institution. And I would say that generally the appeal um, that um, institutions of higher learning in the U.S. Uh, make in big part is that basically the ability to attract talented um, scholars from all over the world benefits American uh, academia and production of knowledge. And actually, Princeton is a great example of exactly that. And no one exemplifies those uh, values more than uh, my sister. She is an expert uh, on the Middle East, in part because she is from the Middle East. Uh, so uh, she's exactly the type of student that American uh, higher education wants uh, to, to attract. Um, and that ties her to the U.S., um, she has lived in the U.S. for the past seven years, even before uh, she started the, the Ph.D. So she is a, a resident of New Jersey, uh, although she is not a U.S. citizen. Um, she um, living in the U.S. just on the student uh, visa through uh, Princeton. Now, the third component of I think what makes her uh, a U.S. interest, and I think the strongest one, is that the U.S. has the most leverage here. The U.S. is providing direct financial assistance to the Iraqi government, a lot of it. And that means that the U.S. has the ability to get her out because there is that assistance should come with some measure of accountability of where that money goes. And the fact that the U.S. provides hundreds of millions of dollars in military assistance to the Iraqi government means that the Iraqi government should make sure that that money does not end up in the hands of terrorists. And I wanted to add one more uh, small thing is that uh, in addition to KH being part of the Popular Mobilization Forces, KH also has a political wing called the Chalkat Hukuk Movement, the rights movement, uh, basically. And it's a, it's a political movement. They have six members in the Iraqi parliament, and they're, in fact, a part of the governing coalition of the current prime minister, Sudani. So... They aren't oh, very often when I tell people that my sister is being held hostage by a Shia militia in Iraq, they imagine some insular group hiding in the mountains, keeping her in a cave. No, they're roaming the, the streets of Baghdad, 
They are in parliament. They're not hiding. They're not ashamed. They're, they, they absolutely know that there is no accountability. And they're also killing American soldiers. Yes, they do that too. All right. <laughs> Tell us about what we know about the circumstances of her abduction a year ago. So – she uh, was kidnapped uh, actually eight uh, days after having spinal cord uh, surgery. While she was doing the field work um, in Iraq, uh, she had a slip disc, just bad luck. Um, she was in so much pain, she couldn't travel uh, out of uh, Iraq to have the surgery anywhere else. So she had the spinal cord surgery in Baghdad, which, yeah, is a bad idea. And she was recovering uh, from uh, the, the surgery, and she just kind of regained even the ability to go outside. And she, she went out to a coffee shop um, in the neighborhood um, where she lived. Uh, it's the Karada uh, neighborhood, for those listeners who know it. It's a... Uh, uh, considered a very safe uh, neighborhood uh, in uh, Baghdad. It's full of Iraqi police. There are a lot of Westerners uh, there, bustling markets. It's considered a very safe area. Um, she went to a coffee shop and never came back. And for a long time, there was simply no word of anything. There was no indication whether she was alive. And then... There was, I guess, I want to say like six months ago or something like that, there was a video of her released. So give us a sense of the timeline of, of what happened over the course of the year. When did you know she had been abducted? When did you know that she was alive? And uh, then let's talk about the video. So – Initially, uh, so I was the one who raised the alarm about uh, her missing. Uh, and you just knew she was missing because you hadn't heard from her? or Yeah. Um, I uh, sent her a, a, a video of my son, her only nephew, and he is the apple of her eye. And even she could be grumpy, tired, busy, or mad at me. But if I sent her uh, his uh, pictures, she always responds very quickly. So I sent her uh, a video Twelve hours later, uh, she still has not responded. I knew something was off. Um, and I started uh, making phone calls and trying to figure out what's happening. I even had uh, a friend call hospitals in uh, Baghdad uh, asking if they – so I initially hoped – I guess it's almost sick uh, to think that's a hope – um, that maybe she was in some car accident or because she is still recovering from the surgeries that she, I don't know, like passed out or something and is lying unconscious in some hospital in Baghdad. And it, that uh, was uh, ruled out. Um, then I contacted the Israeli, Russian and American authorities and then gradually um, I was informed that that she she was in fact uh, kidnapped by uh, KH and that she's alive. So you kept it quiet for a long time, um, and I think it was finally announced by New Lines, if I'm remembering right, which is a publication with which she had worked. Let me correct that. Yeah, it was announced by the Cradle, um, which is actually. It's a media outlet with a not fully clear ownership, but it's aligned with the resistance axis, so with the Mawakwa. So it wasn't New Lines who uh, made it public. It's initially, the cradle made it public. I see. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. And then um, there has been this um, uh, kind of weird misinformation that somehow it's the Israeli government that announced that she's being held hostage. That's not true. Actually, the Israeli government responded to the cradle publishing it. And after the cradle publishing it, the New York Times were about to publish a piece um, that they have had for a while and kept uh, from actually publishing it because I have asked them to. And why were you keen to keep it quiet? Because I didn't want her to become, for all of this to become a spectacle of global proportions because I... 
had hope that this can be resolved quietly without raising the stakes. And yeah, so I I try to keep it quiet for as long as possible. And then the cradle decided that July 5th is the day um, that they're going to make it uh, public. Um, and then once the New York Times were about to publish it, then the Israeli government issued a statement. So we didn't choose for this to become public, nor the timing of it becoming public. And when did the video, the video was released in the fall, is that right? November 13th. And the video, for those who haven't seen it, is a, a kind of classic hostage video. It must have been both very difficult to watch, but also encouraging in the sense that she was alive and apparently uh, unhurt. Uh, so talk about the video and and what it meant to see it. Yeah, so the the video was uh, released, uh, like I said, on uh, November uh, 13th, and it was just appeared on the El Arabiya Network uh, Twitter uh, account. Um, and the first moment I realized what it is, I got I get really scared because it was 30 minutes after um, Hamas released um, a video of um, an Israeli soldier, Noam Marziano, first talking to the camera, and then the video ended with her dead body. And I just froze in, in fear. But then I watched it, and it's the worst type of roller coaster that one can imagine because the content of it was horrifying because she in it they made her confess to being uh, both a CIA and a Mossad uh, agent somehow at the same time because that's a thing that happens in the world and really bizarre things that really reflect kind of the inner world of this uh, militias and the conspiracy, uh, really absurd ones they believe in. So it's, on one hand, terrifying to see her say that. Um, first, because I know her, and I know they had to torture her to get that out of her. There is no way that she would just agree to say those absurd things. She's someone who cares about the truth way too much. She... She wouldn't even tell white lies just to make people feel better about themselves. I knew that she wouldn't say something so absurd if they didn't torture her into doing that. So that's uh, horrifying. And yeah, I just, uh, the way she looks in the video, she looks exhausted and worn down and despondent. And she's very rarely any of those uh, things. But on the other hand, she's, she's alive and she's her. So she, they haven't emptied her of herself, if that makes sense. She still had, there were a few, mo a, a few moments in the video where she makes her like sarcastic uh, half smile when she smiles with only half of her face. Uh, and, and I'm like, oh. You're there. That's that's really encouraging. You are still in there. They have not worn you down completely. And when she, at the end of the video, she calls uh, on her family and friends. Interestingly, not any of the governments that she supposedly works uh, for uh, to do everything to secure her release. And she names uh, us uh, members of her family. And when she says our names, there is a, a smile on her face that uh, was uh, really heartwarming uh, to see. But uh, yeah, it's generally really watching that video. And here I'll have to confess that I've watched it way too many hundreds of times that it's, uh, yeah, it's each time I see it, it's some horrible combination of Missing her and being happy she's alive and being mortified at what she's going through. 
You mentioned both that the Israeli government was a bit preoccupied with other things right now, but also that the circumstances of the release of that video strongly suggest that Khatib Hezbollah is trying to sort of glom itself on to the holding of other Israeli hostages by Hamas. Has there been any movement of any kind uh, since the release of that video or are we basically still in the same situation that we were in November 13th? So there has been a movement in the sense that um, I've been uh, really uh, focused on getting uh, more congressional attention uh, to my uh, sister's situation and the funding um, of uh, Khatib Hezbollah uh, through the Iraqi government by the U.S. And actually, the fact is that uh, KH has taken such a, pro- a prominent role in attacking uh, U.S. Uh, facilities and then uh, the fatal attack on Tower 22 in Jordan, which killed uh, three uh, American uh, soldiers. All of that was conducted by KH as well. Um, so that was actually a moment at which suddenly a lot of people uh, knew who Katib Hezbollah is. Uh, because when I was in D.C. in September, I had to explain to people what is uh, Katib Hezbollah. When I was here in February, a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, those people. So generally, there is more attention to Katib Hezbollah, more attention to the fact that they are part of the Iraqi government. And in addition to that, uh, there is increased, in parallel to the increase in attention from Congress, there is also increased concern on the Iraqi government side. And the way I know that is because uh, just last month, they hired uh, three new lobbying uh, firms. Uh, yeah, the Iraqi government um, signed contracts to the tune of $1.6 million in contracts with D.C. lobbying firms uh, to improve the, the standing of Iraq in D.C. So clearly, that is not a negligible sum of money, especially for the Iraqi government. So clearly they understand that they have a problem here, but instead of managing a PR problem, they could just let her go. Right, although their PR problem is broader than your sister, right? Their PR problem is that they are both themselves partners and hostages of Khatib Hezbollah and they're, they're, uh, you know, kind of twisted in knots trying to manage that. I would say that uh, letting uh, getting my sister free would go a long way to improving I, their PR. I, I could not agree with that more. You have spent a lot of time in Washington over the last few months. More than I ever wanted. What institutions here have been helpful? It's a very good question and one that is harder for me to answer as of yesterday. So I have been uh, making progress uh, in raising uh, congressional attention to my uh, sister's situation. And I got um, a lot of support from different members of Congress who uh, genuinely care about my sister's uh, well-being, find it abhorrent that a terror organization that is killing Americans and holding my sister hostage gets to benefit from U.S. assistance, and generally kind people who know my sister and care about her. Uh, Each time I come to D.C., I find more people who know her, and everyone who knows her loves her. Uh, So every time someone tells me, oh, I know your sister, I always breathe a sigh of relief because I know, oh, they're committed because um, she's truly amazing. And uh, I would say that Uh, There have been a lot of helpful uh, people, but at the same time, I was actually disappointed when at the rally that uh, I held today in front of the Iraqi embassy, calling on the Iraqi embassy to do more and to stop delaying uh, and giving empty promises, we uh, were expecting 
uh, more uh, congressional uh, presence, but it seems like there is some resistance that's uh, rooted in a fear of kind of disturbing the relationship uh, with Iraq. Um, the Iraqi prime minister is coming to Washington, D.C. And this is the same Iraqi prime minister whose coalition includes yeah. the party that Khatib Hezbollah is the military wing of, essentially. Yes, yes. They, they are his allies. They are his friends. He knows these people. And he's, uh, yeah, he's going to come shake President Biden's hand while the other one holds the uh, uh, keys to my sister's shackles. That's a part that just breaks my heart and really upsets me that he is going to come here and get the VIP treatment and be treated as a legitimate leader of a sovereign country, yet somehow at the same time, he gets away with just saying like, oh, yeah, she's in Iraq, but we can't do anything. So which is it? Do you have the ability to exercise minimal sovereignty over your own capital or don't you? And if you, if you do, then get her home. And if you don't, then why is anyone uh, – why should anyone be inspired to send you another single dollar of military assistance? So a lot of people – listening to this are going to say – they're going to make a lot of – and I actually did about Elizabeth – make a lot of political assumptions about her. Her, She was very outspoken politically. She was very uh, – She is. In, in my – yes, indeed. In my <laughs> – uh, she hasn't been speaking much. Uh, she has been very outspoken politically. She's very left. And I assumed – Whenever I interact, whenever I would see her Twitter, that she and there and you, whom uh, whose existence I did not know about, uh, therefore came out of this kind of Tel Aviv Ashkenazi uh, uh, lefty environment. And the last extended text exchange that I had with her, uh, she was in Jerusalem uh, before she went back to Iraq, and she told me a bit of her story. Which, which was that you guys grew up in a sort of far right settlement, and yeah. she really broke with that. But that that's a a sort of part of her background, and I'm interested in your getting back to her, to her trajectory. How do you go from um, being you guys are the daughters of of a very famous. Russian Jewish dissident. How do you go from growing up in a in a in in that community in a in a right wing settlement to being an all but native Arabic speaker who uh, goes to Syria and Iraq to to understand conflict zones by interacting with people? That's quite a journey. I, I guess you can see that as a journey, but I would say that to me it makes perfect sense because it stems from the same worldview um, of critical thinking. And I think more than our parents, they didn't necessarily indoctrinate us to any one worldview, but showed us by example as well to challenge every truth proclaimed by any structure of power. So as often happens um, when people are taught to be critical thinkers, they also criticize the structures that they are part of. And in this sense, uh, everyone who knows uh, my sister knows how intellectually honest she is and how she takes very principled positions uh, none of them are tribalist or lazy. She truly believes in the values she holds dear. Um, and this is uh, no exception. Uh, she fundamentally believes in the uh, goodness and deservedness of happiness of every person, no matter what religion, race, or country they were born into. And that is something that's perfectly consistent with going to Iraq to study Iraqis because to understand conflict, you need to 
go talk to the parties to the conflict. So um, we're definitely not part of some Tel Aviv elite, <laughs> but yeah, uh, at the same time, I uh, would say that my sister is not at all a dogmatic person. It's not like she subscribes to some worldview and is never willing to change her mind. In fact, people who follow her on Twitter, of which there are many, uh, if you go back to like, the decade of her tweets, you can see her position evolving on different uh, issues uh, because uh, she's someone who is so compassionate and intellectually uh, curious. She is very open to changing her mind. We're a year in to her captivity. She doesn't seem to be the subject of any, you know, we have these very high profile uh, hostage negotiations with the between Israel and Hamas I hear almost nothing about her you know negotiations to free her what is the mechanism um is it going to be us pressure related to a larger concern about Khatib Hezbollah killing americans is it the intervention of some outside party what what is the mechanism that you imagine uh, making this happen? Yeah, so thank you for asking that because I think that's a crucial uh, point here. The situation is complex, but the solution is in some ways very simple. So the Iraqi government receives a lot of U.S. assistance. And, and Khatib Hezbollah is part of the Iraqi government apparatus. The Iraqi prime minister knows Katib, uh, the leaders of Qatib Hezbollah. He knows where to find them. In the past, he has actually intervened in cases when they have abducted uh, people and got them released. So this isn't some convoluted uh, four-dimensional chess game in which a bunch of different uh, parties need to negotiate some complex solution. My sister comes home after someone in D.C. decides to pick up the phone and make a stern enough demand of the Iraqi government to let her go because this is untenable. The end. That is literally all it would take. And that is a very simple solution to a very complex problem, but it can be done. And the Iraqi prime minister have been trying to get a White House uh, visit for a very long time. He finally received it. This is an amazing opportunity for the U.S. government to tell the Iraqi uh, prime minister that any type of meeting with the president is conditional on my sister's freedom. That's all it would take. Do you have any indication that such a message has been sent? No. But I would want it to be. That's if all it would take, literally. And if such a message had been sent, do you think you would know or is it possible that the State Department, the White House is communicating exactly this to the Iraqis um, but to you, you know, they're not advertising that because why do it until you have a success? That would be a very optimistic uh, point of view. I seriously doubt it. Simply because when the Iraqis feel pressure, they show it. So I currently do not see them sufficiently worried. They think that this is a problem they can just wait out and it will go away. That they can just ignore this and have their uh, state visit and have uh, very nice uh, dinners and handshakes and conversations about the, the importance of the bilateral relationship. They simply are not sufficiently motivated, and the tell would be if they got motivated. So far, I have not seen that, sadly. We're going to leave it there. Emma Tsurkov, uh, we are wishing your sister all the best, and uh, you as well. I couldn't admire more the uh, work that you've been doing for the last year and uh, uh, while the situation is horrible, uh, getting to know you in the context of it has been uh, genuinely lovely. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me drawing attention to this. And if anyone is interested in helping, um, 
I would welcome you to go uh, to the website of the Campaign to Free My Sister. The website is bringelizabethhome.com. Uh, sign up and help us bring her back. Thank you so much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution, our audio engineer. This episode is me. I did it myself. And uh, so any problems, just blame on me. One thing I did not do myself, however, is promote the Lawfare Podcast. That's your job. So please tweet the Lawfare Podcast. Share us on Facebook, on Blue Sky, on Mastodon, on Threads, on Instagram, TikTok videos, Pinterest, all the things, YouTube, share the Lawfare Podcast. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patia. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.